Greetings all. This is your AEW Dynamite review for March the 18th, 2020. Last night's episode was an interesting one. It was an empty arena match. And at first, I thought I was going to be disappointed because Cody came out, Cody Rhodes, uh, that is, of course, to cut a promo. And it was like all in a darkened arena with spotlight on the ring. You know, you couldn't see the stage or the ramp or obviously any of the audience chairs and I was like oh my goodness this is going to be like what the WWE has been doing with Smackdown and Raw and you know their various shows we're going to have an empty arena match we just have two guys in the ring and uh, the announced team on the mic and that's it no screen you know Titantron no pyro no lights it's just going to be boring as heck and then he called out he called out the young buck who's not on the um, reserve list. I can't remember the name right now. I know it's the one who's not Matt. That's awful of me, but I just always call them the young bucks. I, I often forget what their names are. And then called out Kenny Omega. You know, he has like his, his arms, you know, like a bit of a sling there, you know, his forearm. He's injured. I don't know if it's legit or kayfabe. I think it's legit to a degree, but it's probably mostly kayfabe. You know, poor Kenny's always got nagging injuries. And uh, eventually they called out Adam Page, and, you know, they had a little talk to see if the elite's all on the same page. They talked about their run-in with the Inner Circle last week and about Blood, Blood and Guts coming up next week. Basically, they're war games, but don't tell anybody. And um, then at the end of the, excuse me, then at the end of the promo... Cody, a little conflab after that, Cody said, you know, oh, what the heck, something like that, paraphrasing, you know, let's do this, and they turned on the lights, and we got to see the Titan Troubles all lit up, and he said they're going to have with the pyro and the entrances, and they brought out, and like, a few wrestlers and other staff members to basically sit in the front rows around the ring, so at least uh, the arena had a somewhat lived-in look, and uh, my goodness, it was great, especially MJF. Oh my goodness, he had like a little gambling, you know, gimmick going on. He was like betting on the matches, and he was very vocal, you know, especially to those he um he he disliked, you know, being a heel. It was just great. Uh, I I just loved it. And before that, he had a little interview segment with uh, Tony Schiavone. It was just great. And then we had like our different matches. And, it you know it it was a it was a top notch show, I'd say at least an eight maybe a nine out of ten considering what they had to work with, it, they did a great job. And there's even a step up from last week, which I found was kind of a you know it was okay, but there were a few weak spots, such as um, such as the women's match and a bit Bray, a Britt Baker's um, interview segment with Tony Schiavone and a few other things that just didn't click with me. And I also didn't like the um, what I call the gang bang like the gang beat down. By the inner circle and the elite at the end, I was I was expecting someone to come back and get a little bit of their heat back on the you know on the inner circle because they had done a beat down the week before at Moxley and then two weeks ago and but that never happened. But anyway, the matches were great. Um, I liked all of them. The women's match you contrast with last week, the four way where you had you had Sheeta, you had Statlander, you had Riho, Riho making her return. And you had uh, super bad, well, one half super bad Penelope Ford making her in-ring debut at least on Dynamite. She's got a few matches in Dark, most notably recently where she darn, excuse me, I'm a little itchy today. My nose. Most re recently where Penelope gained an upset victory over uh, Riho. They were all great in the ring. And uh, Kip Sabian on the outside interfering, you know, uh, Penelope's half, you know, on behalf of his girlfriend. It was all great. They did a fantastic job. I enjoyed it immensely. I enjoyed the match at the end with the Elite versus the Inner Circle. You know, the Inner Circle went over, which which made sense, you know, putting the baby faces in peril next week for the uh, war games, you know, the, the Steel Cage, the Hell in a Cell, the, uh, you know, the... Elimination Chamber, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's, it's akin to that. It's, it's a cell match, cage match. Oh, and of course, we had been way through at the top of the second hour. We had the debut of the Exalted One. And my guess was right. I said it was either Matt Hardy, speaking of Matt, I'll get to him later, or Brody Lee. It was Brody Lee. 
Bodie Lee, and I, I'm I'm kind of a little unsure how, how I feel about him. He did cut a good promo. I like the part where he said about uh, Christopher Daniels that he was it. Well, it's a good paraphrase. The first old man that held him down, but he's going to be the last. That was great because Christopher Daniels came out, you know, confronted Evil Uno and Stu Grace, and uh, basically said, you know, he pranked Kazarian by side, and he's like, there is no exalted one. This is all like, you know, bull crap. You know, you guys are just coming out here and like duping. You know, the vulnerable and the stupid into following you. You know, kind of like my aunt. She's pretty stupid. She'll believe anything she sees on TV, but but I digress. Like, she's like one of those people who believed, for example, that it was like a sonic weapon in, like, Cuba that, like, made all the ca Canadian people at the embassy, like, the staff member, basically, like, have headaches and be sick. And then later it turned out with no break as a Zika virus. So, you know, Canada's own investigation confirmed that, you know, which makes more sense, you know, the Zika virus. And Excuse me, jeez. And the Zika virus, you know, and the headaches and being nauseous and affecting the pregnant women. But she thought it was a sonic weapon because she heard that originally on CNN. But CNN's gotten really bad for that sort of thing, for fake news. Never watch CNN. CNN is fake news. MSNBC has its faults, but I like MSNBC, but do not watch CNN. It is fake news. Uh, there's a lot of hyperbole on there. They fight with their guests. They talk over their guests. So, yeah. There's no impartiality. They... They are a lot about hype and hyperbole, and yeah, don't watch them. They are fake news. But anyway, getting back to AEW, like if you one last thing, if you want to watch like any kind of news, watch overseas news like DW Deutsche Welle from Germany in English, and HK in Japan, and you can get them in English. Now just even evens good in a pinch. BBC, BBC, top notch, probably the top English newscaster in the world. Even France 24, you can get on the here on YouTube. You know, watch it in English if you don't know French. Those are all good and give you a diverse stream of news from around the world. I wish I could recommend some for those are Central America, but there aren't really any good alternatives in English. At least that I know of. You know, there's South African news like News 24, I believe. Uh, there's ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Network. You know, get your outside of your home country. Get your news from a diverse plethora of sources, but don't ever rely on CNN, especially as your exclusive news source. They are trash. They've become trash tier. They were good about five years ago, but now they are just trash tier sensationalized crap. But getting back to AEW and the Exalted One, and yeah, and he, Daniels came out, and he's like, yeah, there is no Exalted One. They're up on their, up on their main screen, their Titan Tron, if you would, or rip-off version of the Titan Tron. Uh, you know, this guy appears in like a cloak, you know, white cloak, like a um, distorted voice, like a black doe face and hands, and he walks slowly down this hallway towards Titan Tron, starts talking about, like, you know, Christopher Daniels. Daniel's doubting him, and people doubting him, but he is real. Like, say, he throws back the um, hood to reveal Brody Lee, and then he gives the promo about the old man. And then, you know, they switch back to the rag, and he's standing there between who and Owen's Stu Grace, and uh, they, like, beat the crap out of, like, um, uh, uh, Kazarian and Daniel. He, like, goes to, like, do, like, you know, the kiss there move that he would do in the Wyatt. And when he was a member of the Wyatt family, but, the, uh, like, Dan, Daniel Sim, but then he stopped and he throws him back and, like, just, like, clotheslines him with this vicious lariat and he kind of flips head over heels. <laughs> Daniel that sells it like, um, uh, sells it like a champ. It is great. It is fantastic. And uh, like Brody Lee says that there's promo that, you know, for now on, if the, you know, he's exalted one of the uh, Dark Order, and if he wants something, he's going to take it. And that's going to be the way it's going to be. He's going to bust down your door. Him and the Dark Order are going to take it if you refuse. Uh, great promo, great debut. I mean, yeah, could have been a swerve. Could have been, you know, someone like Raven or James Mitchell, as they said in my prediction video, but it is what it is. I think they made the best of the situation they had, kind of like the empty arena match, and I kind of want to see what Brody Lee will do going forward. Of course, a lot of people say, like, his his singlet he's in, and he's got, like, the uh, eye on it. It's kind of black, or it's got, like, an eye symbol on it. It kind of looks like a, you know, um, off-the-rack version of Diesel from the 1990s, you know, Kevin Nash's bodyguard gimmick when he was, like, palling around with Shawn Michaels in the w then WWF. But I'm willing to give him a chance. Then there was like this, about this time there was um, a, a 
taped vignette, I guess you would call it, where there was like this ring, it looked like some place in like the deep south to midwest, some rural area of the US, and you had like Lance Archer while like Jake the Snake looked on, and gave like this promo, epic promo again. Um, he was like taking out all cars in this makeshift like backyard ring, he was just beating the heck out of people while this like little person like kind of creepy kind of House of a Thousand Corpses vibe from this character and, and the whole setting in general was giving like uh, like op this promo for this open challenge anyone could like fight Brody Lee though not Brody Lee geez. Um Lance Archer that wanted to Lance Archer was just like decimating them and laying waste to them and the way this whole thing was filmed and the characters involved in the setting and Jake's promo you know, wow wow once again Jake's a man and he's really helping elevate Lance Archer you know on his uh Sojin in AEW it was great. It was probably the best segment of the whole night, other than the end. The ending, after the conclusion of the match between the Inner Circle and the Elite, you had, like, um, Jericho and his buddies, like, the Inner Circle were on the stage, Jericho was cutting this promo saying how, you know, everything he ever promised, you know, he and the Inner Circle... You know, we're going to do what they did. And um, then he even, like, with Sammy Guevara, he, like, he was a like he, he was asking, like, um, him and Jericho if, like, Brandy, who was sitting at, like, ringside, you know, as the timekeeper slash announcer, you know, because of reduced staff and stuff like that. And he would have lived in a little east around the ring. Was asking uh, Brandy if she wanted to, like, hook up, like, Sammy, like a real man, because they're old, you know, we're old man. Or, you know, husband was, you know, Cody was a loser. Cause they beat up Cody's who were a lot of the match, like, isolated him. And uh, then this, like, drone came down, like, from the rafters. <laughs> this drone, and then Lance Jericho's like, what the heck is this? And it, like, hovered in the ring, and then it, <laughs> it eventually, like, landed, and, like, oh, the young buck got on the bike and said that, you know, they thought that they were down, like, one man in the five away match uh, next week, you know, at Blood and Guts. But they were wrong, and he there was like someone that oh you know someone who was like broken and owed him a favor, and then it went up to like a, like the camera switched up to like the rafters and like up in the high part of the stands with Sandy Matt Hardy you know back his little broken you know gear you know with um, his leather suit kind of like looked like a dress to me his guns on his arms looked amazing there his biceps and triceps and he had like the streak like in his hair and yep yeah it was Matt Hardy and what an epic ending that was he didn't say anything he just kind of looked like, Ooh, like, he was, like, really, like, angry, like, he could kill one of them if he was down there, like, the inner circle, tearing them all by himself. Matt looked very good for, you know, his age, and for the fact he didn't really do much anything in the E, but he got all of, like, his, um, all of his shine back, as they would say in wrestling, you know, not he, because that's the villain, but his shine, coming in as a baby face, kind of maybe an anti-hero in this capacity. And, like, Jericho, they just cut back his face, and he was, you know, cut back a couple times between him and Matt, and he just, you know, close up as they pulled him to a close up Matt, and he looked, like, completely speechless, and, yeah, it was a fun little show with two great debu debuts. I would argue Matt's was better at the end with that draw, and that was quite unique, the way they set it up. Uh, to be honest, Jericho was rambled on. He had about, you know, five, six minutes thinking, what the heck are they going to do here? Is he just going to ramble on and brag? Like, why are they, like, waiting? It was kind of like about a month ago when, um, more than a month ago now, I think it would be like the end of January, beginning of February, so closer to six weeks ago or more, when um, they had, like, Mockley in the ring, who's, like, teasing, joining the inner circle and just went on and on. You know, maybe a drug a little bit, but, but the payoff, the payoff was worth it. So, um, yeah, eight. Maybe 8.5 or a 10. It, you know, I'm a little stingy with my ratings. I've seen a lot of people give it a 10 or a 10, but it was fantastic. And the thing about this was you could really tell the difference. Now that all the big production feel, the WWE is stripped away between this and AEW, you know, where people actually care about their craft or dedicated. But I don't blame the people in the E because I keep harping on it, but. What happened to Bray Wyatt, the Fiend, where Goldberg came in and squashed him to set up supposedly some big match at WrestleMania with Goldberg having the title? I mean, why should you care if you're a worker? Why should you? You put a lot of, you know, quote-unquote work and a lot of effort into your craft, into owning your in-ring skills, you're building up your character, sharpening your promo skills. Then why should you care building up a character or investing in a storyline or series of them when... Some old guy, you know, some ex wrestler at the whim of Vince McMahon can come in anytime they want to and take everything away from you. Why should you even care? 
I mean, AEW was even released a press release saying that people that couldn't show up because it was Marco Stunt wasn't there tonight with Jurassic Express. They had a match between the Butcher and the Blade, which I kind of glossed over. It was a good match. It was a good little match. Nothing special, but I did like it. And Marco wasn't there, and like, uh, you know, Bunny Alley wasn't there. And um, there were a few other performers also that were, you know, because because by their absence, such as. Um, Pack. I can't really say his nickname. I don't think on YouTube. You know, it's part of Death Triangle now with the Lucha Brothers. Uh, he was, you know, and they were um, taking on the best friends of Orange Cassidy. Orange Cassidy arrived. Always there's one point where it's like showing him like sleeping, basically, <laughs> pretending he was asleep. But when he was sitting with the announced team of uh, Jr. and and, um, and Taz. And I always forget the other guy's name. The mask. But um, someone, you know post that in the comments probably if I get any comments for this video. But um yeah, Pac wasn't there. But they came back to what AEW said, like, you know, the management like Tony Khan and the other management, you know, the elite. They were saying you won't lose your spot if you can't show up or you feel you're not safe for you to show up. Another guy I really liked um, you know, his facials and expressions and stuff at Ringside was uh Sunny Kiss. <laughs> he did a great job at Ringside. Great job. Getting back to what I was saying about the E, you know, this contrast with the E where, you know, you have to jealous the guard your spot and, but worse yet for the young guys, like Bray Wyatt, like you talk about who, you know, elevated himself again after, you know, his failure of his cult leader gimmick, you know, after he's squashed by Cena. If if a guy like a semi retired wrestler like a Goldberg or a Rock, you know, can come right in and squash you anytime they want to, and, you know, Vince McMahon's whim and take your spot and all your work for nothing, and you're back to like square one. Or you can be a million like Rusev with like the awful gimmick that he was saddled with, the whole on and Lashley thing that really went nowhere. I mean, sure, he was kind of getting a bit of shine by getting over on them, but now that all seems to be forgotten and it's just after like about a year of humiliation, what's the point? What's the point of caring? What's the point of doing anything? There, you know, I hate to be nihilistic, but what's the point? That's why I think uh, now that all the production and the big crowds are stripped away, bigger crowds, you know, you definitely get some pretty crowds itself, but the bigger crowds of the ear stripped away. You know, the emperor has no clothes, and now we're seeing the bare bones, whatever analogy you prefer. Um, there's not really the passion on the side of most of the work. I'm not saying some of the workers for the WDB don't have passion, but you see it now. You're seeing it more clearly than ever that there's more passion on the side of... AEW and that those workers actually care because they're invested because this company they feel belongs to them to a degree that you don't see in the WWE. You know, it hasn't been corporatized and sanitized and all been controlled by one madman who will not listen to fan or worker, you know, worse yet, worker or talent input. So, yeah, why should they bother? I wouldn't. They're putting their bodies on the line, their health on the lines. I mean, wrestlers about a decade ago were routinely dying in their 40s. I mean, they do not have a good quality of life even now when they get old because of all those stunts they do, like day in, day out. It's a very grindy, very mentally and physically breaking down business. And why should you care? Why should you put your body, your mind, and your livelihood every day on the line, in some cases your life? You know, for the more extreme styles that do a lot of stunts, like Jeff Hardy, for example, back in the day, when the Young Bucks contemporaneously, why should you? If Vince is not going to respect you in the WWE, why should you care? I wouldn't. Nobody would. You'd have to be crazy. But, yeah, I'll give it 8, 8.5. 8.5 out of 10. Uh, it was a fantastic show. I loved it. They did a lot of what they had. And, um, yeah, fantastic interview. I've got to, uh, sounds like I could Google up my cat and she wants it and she don't like being locked out. Anyway, have a great day. Till next time.